Ladies and gentlemen, may I draw your attention, please? We will now start the high level panel five artificial intelligence of the 18th annual meeting of the Internet Governance Forum. I will now invite the guests of honor to deliver keynote speeches. First, I would like to welcome His Excellency Mr. Kishida Fumio, the Prime Minister of Japan, to deliver keynote speech. His Excellency Mr. Kishida, please proceed to the podium. Uh, internet. On behalf of the host country, I would like to welcome you to the special session on AI at the Internet Governance Forum Kyoto 2023. As the potential and risks of rapidly developing generative AI are being debated around the world, it is gratifying that the topic of global AI governance is being discussed by representatives with diverse fields today in Tokyo, correction, in Japan. I would like to thank you all for taking part in this session. Generative AI has been called as a technological innovation comparable to the Internet. Just like the Internet has brought about remarkable democracy and socio-economic development by connecting people beyond the constraints of time and space, generative AI is about to change the history of mankind. This year, I myself have had participated in discussions with young researchers and AI developers only to realize the unlimited possibilities that generative AI holds. Generative AI not only improve operational efficiency, but also to accelerate innovation in various fields such as drug discovery and development of new treatment, thereby bringing about dramatic changes in the world. We expect the world will be changed dramatically. The Japanese government is planning to compile economic policy package by the end of this month that include support for strengthening AI development, such as for building computational resources and foundational models, as well as AI introduction support by SMEs and to medical, medical application. We will incorporate strong support for both AI development and utilization in that package. On the other hand, risks of sophisticated false images and disinformation that cause social disruption or other threats to the society are pointed out. A wide range of stakeholders need to play their roles in the development of AI. For example, in order to promote the distribution of reliable information, it would be effective to develop and promote the spread of technologies that can prove and confirm the originator of the information or provenance technologies. The international community as a whole must share this understanding and deal with these issues in solidarity. It is important that we should now gather our wisdom of mankind to strike a balance between promotion and regulation, while taking into account the possibilities and risks of 
generative AI in order to reduce the risks it poses to the economy and society while maximizing its benefits to all of us. With this in mind, at the G7 Hiroshima Summit, I proposed the creation of the Hiroshima AI process to further international discussions towards the realization of trustworthy AI, which was agreed upon by the leaders and the G7 leaders instructed their ministers in charge to deliver the results within this year. The Hiroshima AI process is to develop by the end of this year the international guiding principles for all AI actors as common principles indispensable for the realization of trustworthy AI. In particular, as a matter of urgency, we are working on international guiding principles and a code of conduct for organizations developing advanced AI systems, including generative AI, in preparation for the G7 Summit online meeting to be held this fall. Generative AI is a cross-border service, therefore concerns people all over the world. For this reason, the Hiroshima AI process will also take advantage of this IGF opportunity to incorporate a wide range of views through multi-sector discussions, including governments, academia, civil society, and the private sector. By being informed by the opinions of diverse stakeholders beyond the G7 who are participating today, we will drive the creation of international rules that will enable the entire international community, including the Global South, to enjoy the benefits of safe, secure, and trustworthy generative AI and to achieve further economic growth and improvement of living conditions. Before closing, I would like to express my hope that this special session on AI will be a landmark meeting where meaningful discussions will be held among representatives of international organizations, governments, AI developers, researchers, and civil society that will later be remembered as a turning point in the discussion on generative AI. With this, I would like to conclude my remarks. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Excellency. Next, I would like to welcome Ms. Maria Ressa, CEO and President of Rappler Inc., 2021 Nobel Peace Prize winner, to deliver keynote speech. Ms. Ressa, please proceed to the podium. I'm so sorry I'm short. I will tiptoe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you to our host country, to Japan, to the Internet Governance Forum. I am new to the Internet Governance Forum, and so I bow to your collective wisdom. I really hope to just be a voice to urge you to think about where we are today and to urge you to act. Because thank you to, the, to, to our initiative on generative AI, but let me just remind you of the problems we face right now. Today, truth is under attack. We're engulfed in an information war where disinformation, 
the bullets of information operations spread like wildfire to obscure and to change reality. What power used to consolidate power is technology, social media, the first human contact with AI. In 2018, and this has probably changed since then, MIT released a study that said lies spread six times faster on social media than these really boring facts. And what Rappler data has shown is that it spreads even faster when it's laced with fear, anger, hate. Every human being, all of us, has two systems of thinking, and here I quote Daniel Kahneman. He said, thinking fast, our emotional, instinctive side, and thinking slow, our rational side. This rational side is where conversations like this one happen, where rule of law, journalism, democracy happens. Technology hacked our biology to bypass our rational minds, to trigger the worst of who we are, and to keep us scrolling in our information economy. Attention, that is the prize. Your attention is commodified, changing how you feel, what you think, and how you act. That fundamental design choice, and this is the first social media contact, right? That lie spread faster, surveillance capitalism, or surveillance for profit turned our world upside down. And here, I'm sorry to be uh, <laughs> irreverent. Netflix's Stranger Things, if you've watched it, you know how they go into the upside down? We are literally living in the upside down. And while it seems deceptively familiar, everything is covered with goo and there are monsters in every corner. Because that design of the new gatekeepers to our public sphere was exploited by authoritarians. If you can convince people lies are facts, then you can control them. And the same three sentences I've said since 2016. Without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without these three, we have no shared reality, no rule of law, no democracy. So I have two minutes left to tell you what we should do. And, and actually, the internet we want has those five values. I thank the Secretary General for appointing the leadership panel. We each have two years. It's extremely honest, open, and we hope to urge you to act. But I'll leave you with two last thoughts. One is the impact beyond the individual. This is what we've, I've laid out for you, right? The behavioral aspect for us. If you don't have integrity of facts, you cannot have integrity of elections. And 2024 becomes a critical year for elections, which is part of the reason everyone in this room, from civil society, parliamentarians, government officials, NGOs, journalists, we each have a role to play. I keep saying that we are in the last two minutes, if you play basketball, last two minutes for democracy. In my last minute, I just want to tell you about an initiative that aligns with the Internet Governance Forum that was launched last year uh, at the Nobel Summit for uh, the Nobel Peace Summit in DC this year. Over 300 Nobel laureates, civil society groups, the same kind of multi-stakeholder arrangement we need to come together. We launched a 10-point action plan that has three buckets. And these would be the same that you would need to operationalize in every single one of our agreements. The first, stop surveillance for profit. Give us back our lives. Two, stop coded bias. 
If you are a woman, LGBTQ+, you are further marginalized in the virtual world, and we want a secure, safe, and trustworthy internet. Third, journalism as an antidote to tyranny. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ressa. Next, I would like to welcome Mr. Wulik Vestergaard Knudsen, OECD Deputy Secretary General, to deliver keynote speech. Mr. Knudsen, please. Thank you very much. It seems I have uh, the opposite challenge uh, compared to the previous speaker, so I will not be tiptoeing. Uh, what an honor it is to uh, speak after a prime minister and a, and a Nobel uh, Prize winner, and what an honor it is indeed uh, to join this high-level uh, meeting uh, on global AI governance and generative uh, AI, convened uh, in the context of the G uh, G7 uh, Hiroshima AI process uh, led by uh, Japan. Thank you very much. Rapid technological information transformation is heralding a brand new era of boundless opportunity, and at the same time, of great risks. Some even talk about uh, existential threats. Now, my organization, the OECD, was founded over 60 years ago on a simple yet very powerful premise that international cooperation is essential for economic growth and social prosperity. In the decades gone by, we have leveraged evidence-based uh, policy expertise, mutual exchange, data and analysis to keep ahead of the global uh, cross-border challenges. Key examples include codes of liberalization, uh, guidelines for multinational uh, enterprises, and of course the all-famous BEPS inclusive framework of tax with almost 140 tax jurisdictions around the world. To sum it up, through international cooperation and shared values, the OECD's goal has been to drive forward better policies for better lives. And let me be as frank as I can, digital policies are no exception to that. On the contrary, here too, the OECD has delivered landmark international standards. For example, just last year, the Declaration on Government Access to Personal Data held by the private sector entities. These standards, and many others in areas like broadband connectivity, data governance, and digital security, provide guidance to support countries in reaping the benefits of digital transformation, uh, fostering innovation while addressing mitigating risks, advancing responsibility, and promoting trust. In the last decade, we have increasingly dedicated our attention to artificial intelligence. With, a, with AI, and in particular with the public availability of generative AI applications, humanity is facing what is really a watershed moment. Our well-being, our economic prosperity, and our very identity, perhaps, even as humans, will be affected by the collective action we take today. AI already now demonstrates its revolutionary potential for productivity, for scientific discoveries, healthcare, education, climate change. However, AI also carries significant risks, including to privacy, safety, autonomy, and, to some extent at least, jobs. And as G7 members have underlined, under the Japanese uh, presidency, generative AI creates a real risk of false and misleading content, threatening democratic values and social cohesion, I guess what you could call the upside-down world of Stranger Things from, from Netflix. Generative AI also raises complex questions of copyright, and the computing power required for its training highlights issues of supply chains, access, and divides. What we need now, ladies and gentlemen, is a global effort for the governance, the safe development and deployment of AI, aligned with human rights and democratic values. The OECD has helped lead the way on AI policy making with the landmark 2019 OECD recommendations on AI, the very first intergovernmental standard on AI. We are now gathering the evidence on AI through the OECD AI Policy Observatory, the framework for classification of AI systems, the catalog of tools and metrics, and also now uh, the latest, the AI Incidents Monitor. These achievements have gained, have gained traction and influenced AI policymaking around the world. 
But with technology developing now at breakneck speed, we need to make collective decisions to ensure this technology will be safe and beneficial to societies. Unfortunately, as you all know, there are many, many questions and not too many answers. Do we need hard rules about the design of AI systems? How do we marshal the innovation, governance and regulations of AI? Do we use existing approaches and frameworks that have proven effective, from for example aeroplanes to food safety? Or do we need radically new approaches? And how do we prepare society for this transition? How do we make sure powerful technology doesn't rest solely in the hands of a few, be that countries or, or companies? And perhaps most importantly, how do we make sure that we seize the boundless opportunities for people and planet in a just, equitable, and democratic manner? That we don't answer these questions that I raised above uh, with policies that hamper progress. I don't have the answers to all those questions, but I do think I know one thing, that decisions we make in response to these questions require international cooperation and coordination. And it's the ambition of the OECD to work with our international partners to provide the forum and convening power for these discussions, informed by the best possible evidence base. The G7 has a key role. We are here under the auspices of Japan's G7 presidency, and Japan has been a true pioneer and visionary in identifying the policy importance of AI. Japan's 2016 presidency, a G7 presidency, really kick-started development of the AI principles, which then served as the basis for the G20 AI principles under Japan's G20 presidency in 2019. In this vein, the Hiroshima process has set an ambitious and necessary objective international guiding principles applicable for all AI actors and a code of conduct for organizations developing advanced AI systems. The OECD is very proud to be informing this process in many ways, not least later this year by launching uh, the Global Challenge alongside our key partner organizations like UNESCO uh, and others. And we also uh, look forward to providing comprehensive guidance across different actors and different aspects of AI. Before I end, let me say that we cannot advance the global effort on AI governance without effective stakeholder engagement. Multi-stakeholder participation has always been the OECD approach to policy development. Examples include our one AI expert group with over 400 international experts from governments, from industry, from academia, and from civil society. Or, uh, the recently launched OECD Global Forum on Technology is another uh, example of this, this way of building outreach and engagement. Only, uh, honestly, with your involvement can we develop policies that work for all parts of society. Prime Minister, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Hawking defined intelligence, uh, and I quote, as the ability to adapt to change, unquote. Let us continue working together to ensure that our intelligence, both human and artificial, will keep politically paced with developments and continue to guide us responsibly. We simply cannot afford not to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Knudsen. Unfortunately, His Excellency Mr. Kishida Humiyo will not be able to stay due to the schedule. So please give him a round of applause. Thank you. Now the panel discussion shall commence. I would like to ask Ms. Emma Risa, Associate Professor Institute of Future Initiative, the University of Tokyo, to moderate the session. Ms. Emma, floor is yours. So uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Arisa Emma. Uh, Emma is my family name. Uh, and uh, so I am associate professor at the University of Tokyo. And it's a really great honor for me to moderate this great panel session. 
So first of all, I would like to introduce the panelists. Uh, I go from my side to the other end. So the person next to me uh, here uh, is the Mr. Nick Clegg, president of Global Affairs, Meta. Then the second person is the Mr. Luciano Mazza de Andrade, uh, director of the Department of Science and Technology and Intellectual Property at the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Brazil. The third person is Ms. Denise Wong, Assistant Chief Executive, Data Innovation and Protection Group, Info, uh, Info Common Media Development Authority, IMDA, Singapore. The next panelist is Mr. Nazal Patiria, Vice Minister of Communication of the Informatics Indonesia. The next panelist is Mr. Kent Walker, President of Global Affairs, Google and Alphabet. On the right-hand side, we have His Excellency Mr. Suzuki Junji, Minister of Internal Affairs and Communications. Okay. Uh, the panels next to Minister Suzuki is Mr. Vinton Surf, IGF Leadership Panel Chair and so-called Father of the Internet. <laughs> And next to Mr. Saf, we have Professor Jim Rai from Keio University, as known as father of Japan's internet. <laughs> and last but not least, the panelist on the other end is Ms. Doreen Botgan Martin, Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union. So uh, we have excellent lineup of panelists, but before we jump in the panel discussion, I would like to invite Minister Suzuki to share with us the brief overview of the current state of Hiroshima AI process led by the Japanese government now. So Minister Suzuki, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I am Suzuki Junji, Minister of International Affairs and Communication. I would like to extend my gratitude to all those who are attending the Internet Governance Forum Kyoto 2023. I would also like to thank Ms. Maria Ressa and Mr. Ulrich Knussen, OECD General and Secretary General, for their very insightful keynote speeches. Now, I would like to introduce the status of the discussion on the Hiroshima AI process to set a stage for a panel discussion with multi-stakeholders to be held in this session. The rapid development and penetration of generative AI is now a matter of responsibility for us, the international community, to maximize its benefit to humanity while mitigating its risks to the economy and society. G7 Gunma Takasaki Digital and Tech Ministers meeting held April this year agreed to promptly discuss the opportunities and risks posed by General AI and to utilize the OECD and G, uh, GPAY, an international public private partnership on AI, to establish a forum for international discussion on General AI, including five issues such as AI governance and promotion of transparency. And in the G7 Hiroshima leaders communique, it was decided to continue the discussion of the Hiroshima AI process. Subsequently, in September this year, the Hiroshima AI process G7 digital and tech minister statement was formulated, which agreed on the following points. First point, necessity to prioritize issues such as ensuring transparency. Two, establishment of international guide, guiding principles for all AI actors and code of conduct for organization developing the advanced AI system. Three, project-based cooperation, including promotion of research that contribute to countermeasures against disinformation. Four, importance of exchanging views with stakeholders other than G7 governments. In today's session, we would like to receive opinions from panelists on the contents of the international guiding principles and the code of conduct for organizations developing advanced AI systems which are currently under consideration. The international guiding principle for organizations developing advanced AI systems is to put together the principles 
that AI, all AI developers are expected to follow to realize safe, secure, and trustworthy AI. It also provides a set of concrete actions as a code of conduct. The first point of which is to measure to uh, mitigate the risks of advanced AI systems to society. This includes measures to identify, value, and mitigate risks before bringing AI models to market, as well as measures to address system vulnerabilities even after market placement. So what types of risks and vulnerabilities should AI developers bear in mind when implementing measures? The second point is to disclose information on the risks and appropriate use of advanced AI systems and to share such information among stakeholders. To ensure the users can use AI systems with confidence, businesses should clarify the result of safety assessment and capabilities and the limitation of their AI models. This also includes uh, developing and disclosing their own policies on private and AI privacy and AI governance, or they could establish a mechanism to develop and share best practices among various stakeholders. The third point is to promote research and investment to technologically mitigate the risks posed by AI, for example, development and introduction of mechanisms that enable users to identify AI-generated and generated content such as digital watermarking and provenance systems. In addition to these, I believe it would be necessary to prioritize the development of advanced AI systems to tackle global issues such as climate change and global health and ensure appropriate handling of data which is fed into advanced AI system. We believe that today's AI special session is a valuable opportunity to directly hear the opinions of people from diverse backgrounds and I am sincerely looking forward to the discussions that are about to take place. I would appreciate your frank opinions. I hope that today's session will be meaningful not only for the panelists but also for all of you who are listening to the discussions in the audience and online. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for this really informative presentation, Minister Suzuki. So then, I would like to invite our panelists to share their views on some of the important aspects in the Hiroshima AI process from their perspectives. So, and I would like to ask my first question. So what types of AI systems, in particular advanced AI models, such as foundation models, are you developing or placing on the market? How are they used? What solutions and benefits do they seek to offer? What do you see as the major risks and challenges are associated with the advanced AI systems you are developing and how you're addressing those risks and challenges? So I hope this question and answer to this will give us an overview of the current situation of generative AI and foundation model across countries. So I would like to ask this question to two speakers from global AI developers, Google and Meta. So first, uh, present Kent Walker. What is your view on this? You have five minutes. Thank you very much, Professor Emma, and thank you for the chance to be here today. The power of AI is vast, and that is exactly why we think it needs to be developed both boldly and responsibly. AI goes well beyond a chatbot. It has the potential to change the way we do science, the way we develop technology. I thought it was very nice that the rounds of applause for today's panel went to our two technologists joining us here today, because that will be the foundation of the next great technological advance we have. Of course, you've been using AI for a dozen years if you've used Google Search or Translate or Maps. But it's going to go well beyond that now. We are seeing dramatic advances that are going to change quantum mechanics, uh, quantum science, uh, material science, precision agriculture, personalized medicine, bring water, clean water to people around the world. The, the potential is extraordinarily exciting. Just one example, our DeepMind team has helped fold proteins, understand how proteins express themselves for the 200 million proteins known to science. That would have taken hundreds of millions of years 
for biologists to do. It's as though you took every man, woman, and child in Japan and trained them to be a biologist and then had them do nothing but fold proteins for three years. And as a result, these tools are now being used by more than a million researchers around the world to help advance the study of medicine. And there are many more advances like that coming. But at the same time, we recognize that all of the opportunity agenda must also be balanced by a responsibility agenda and a security agenda. And it's not for one company or even one group of companies to do alone. We have worked together across the industry on groups like the Frontier Model Forum, the Partnership on AI, ML Commons, and more to develop frameworks, norms for the right kinds of research we need to do, the right standards that need to be applied. And beyond that, we need the role of government and all of you, civil society, for the frameworks that are going to matter to everybody on the planet. This is why we salute and appreciate the leadership of Japan and the Hiroshima process to drive forward with an innovation agenda that recognizes the opportunity, but also the need for thoughtful balance and the, the hard trade-offs that we'll need democracies to exchange ideas about. How do you balance security versus openness? How do you balance the, the various notions of efficiency and equity in these different tools? These are fundamental and important questions, and we welcome the participation of groups like the IGF who have brought wisdom to those debates over the internet as we apply them to this latest and great round of new technology. Thank you. Thank you very much, President Walker. Then I would like to invite President Nick Clegg. Uh, what is your view? You also have five minutes. So, um, as, as Kent said, I mean, a AI, of course, is not new. It's been talked about since the 1950s. And companies like Google, like Meta, like others, sort of research-heavy organizations have been um, conducting research using AI and in integrating it into their products for many, many uh, years. But clearly, this latest development of these large language models is a qualitative and quantitative, because they're very expensive, you need a lot of compute power and a lot of data, um, uh, leap forward. Uh, so we're all asking ourselves in forums like this and many other forums, is it good, is it bad, how is it going to reshape the world? There's been quite a lot of breathless, somewhat hyperbolic predictions about what might happen in the future, and I would really venture three points at this stage. Firstly, where possible, and I think the Deputy Secretary General asked this, is this technology going to be for the many or for the few? Where possible, it is desirable, in my view, that this technology should be shared, that there should be open innovation, there should be open sourcing as much as possible of these foundation models. Um, companies like Meta, like Google, I don't want to speak for Google, but in Meta's case, over the last decade, we have open sourced over a thousand AI databases and models. It's not always appropriate. Sometimes there are reasons not to do it. But where possible, the more that this technology can be shared, because otherwise, the risk is it really, it really is technology which is only uh, developed by a very small number of highly resourced institutions, public and private institutions around the world, with deep enough pockets, with enough GPU capacity, and with enough large-scale data to get their hands on. And that's why we, for instance, have open-sourced our large language model, Llama 2, and we have around, had around 30 million um, uses of it already from researchers, innovators, and developers uh, around the world, including here in China. So that's the first point. The second point is, it is human nature to worry about the worst. Um, but I think it's also worth remembering that AI is also a, it's a sword, not just a shield. If I look, for instance, at the work of Meta in social media and the constant uh, 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 adversarial um, work we have to do to try and minimize bad content, hate speech, for instance, the prevalence of hate speech, and this is publicly available audited data, on Facebook now stands at somewhere between 0.01% and 0.02%. So that means if you're constantly scrolling on Facebook, 
for far too long than you should, um, you would find maybe one or two bits of hate speech out of every 10,000 bits of content that you might find. I wish it would be zero, but it's never going to be zero because, remember, it's, it's legal speech. But here's the point. That is down by over, well, almost, it's down by about 60% just over the last 18 to 24 months for one reason alone, which is AI. So AI, yes, of course, that it poses new challenges. It's also a fantastic tool for us to do, as the uh, Prime Minister himself said, to minimize the bad and amplify, uh, amplify um, the good. And then the final thing I would say is this. As we grapple with risks, yes, there's been lots of talk about long-term potential existential risks. The prospect of so-called uh, you know, autonomous AI or general uh, uh, AI, which will sort of develop an autonomy and agency of its own. But there are things we need to do now, uh, which as mentioned earlier, we need to have some kind of agreement across the industry and with governments and with stakeholders on how we identify the provenance and we can detect AI-generated content not text content, that's not possible, but certainly visual content. The more you can have uniform standards developed quickly, the safer that all those elections that people have talked about which are taking place next year will take place. So I, I think it's important to focus on the here and now, not just on the theoretical tomorrow. Very much, Mr. Clegg. Uh, I believe that the, everyone has a uh, lots of questions, but the, there's a lots of you know um, questions that I have today. So now I move on to the second question. So in this previous question, we heard that AI companies are developing highly advanced AI systems and various applications. At the same time, they are making efforts to respond to risks and challenges brought by generative AI. So the guiding principles and code of conduct for organizations developing advanced AI systems set out how organizations should take measures and actions against risks and challenges prior to the model release and market placement, and should continue to work on addressing vulnerabilities and mitigating risks after the release. What risks and challenges uh, do you think are most important for those organizations to address in their efforts? What technical measures and actions do you think to be most effective? I would like to invite Mr. Nizal to ask, answer this question and give your insight. You have three minutes. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished speakers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. First of all, allow me to thank the organizer of the session for the opportunity to be in the same stage with honorable presenters today to share about artificial intelligence, a hot topic recently. The development of AI has greatly improved efficiency across commercial sectors. In 2021, AI added 26.7 million workers in Indonesia, or equivalent to 22% of the workforce. Yet, we must acknowledge that AI also comes with various risks, such as privacy, intellectual property violations, the potential of biases, as well as hallucinations that requires our attention. Against such backdrop, Indonesia believes we must intensify our approaches on mitigating the risk of AI, both at policy and practical levels. One of the milestone evidence such commitment was made four years ago in Japan when we supported the G20 AI principle during Japan G20 presidency to set a common understanding on the principles of AI. With the recently issued the G7 Hiroshima process as previously presented by Minister Suzuki, the effort to evolve involve different stakeholders, even beyond G7 members, are applaudable. The urgently growing need to establish governance to mitigate various risks that AI, specifically on the generative AI, has demanded us, the global community, to act promptly, but not recklessly. Indonesia is also not waiting in silence. We have begun the development of our AI governance ecosystem from 2020 through several policies, namely National Strategy of Artificial Intelligence, outlining roadmap on the development of AI governance 
ecosystem in Indonesia. Secondly, standard classification of business line for business developing AI-based programming and provision for automated personal data protection under law on personal data protections. Though not specifically addressing AI-based personal data processing, it provides foundation for more complex personal data processing activities. Last but not least, we are also in the process of developing a circular letter on artificial intelligence ethics that is hope to embody principles from prominent global references infused with our local wisdom to respond to the demand of AI governance. Ladies and gentlemen, we understand that the government cannot act alone as such in the process of improving our governance, we invite the involvement from various stakeholders to contribute on the development of our policies as well as ecosystem. Specifically, we are in the pursuit of exploring uses cases, potential risks, as well as approaches and technologies to mitigate risk of AI utilizations. We also cognizance that AI governance itself is not sufficient to mitigate the risk and threat of AI. We still need additional provisions to ensure positive impact of AI for everyone. This includes the implementation of supportive policies encompassing areas such as the content moderation, ensuring fairness and non-discrimination in the market, as well as digital literacy effort. Again, such backdrop, Indonesia is ready to further the discussion of AI global governance, especially to play the role as bridge builder between various countries with different maturity level of AI to ensure our AI utilization might advance the well-being of our society now in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nazal. So I would like to ask the same question to Mr. Matza. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I first of all, I think one of the main things we, we must to, to realize as a, as a challenge is how we can bring uh, more voices from developing countries into this debate. And that's very hard because sometimes for given the true complexity of the issues at hand is not something that's very simply done. Uh, so I will thank you very much, uh, the Japanese government, for the kind of invitation to be here today. I want to commend it for the open way and inclusive way it's making, uh, the efforts making to, to make this process as open and inclusive as, as possible. I think that's, that's very important. Uh, we, I think we, we, we must be realistic about the huge asymmetries in the AI landscape. Uh, and how they affect the way different countries and actors approach this issue when it comes to discussing risks and mitigation, and mitigation measures. Uh, large language models have been developed by few companies based in very few countries. Uh, of course, being mostly just seven countries, the Hiroshima process uh, may be of particular relevance considering this, this, uh, this status quo. Uh, in any event, we're talking about a very concentrated market that may change the future, uh, hopefully it will, but that's the reality today. So in our, from our perspective, I think organizations, that was touched upon before uh, from other colleagues, organizations, particularly in the developing world, uh, should be mindful of the need to bring a sense of local ownership to the countries and communities where they operate. Uh, in the sense, one of the main issues will be, I think, uh, the adaptation of those models to local realities. And crucially here, I think that is an issue of how to adjust the training of the models with data that is more reflective of local circumstances. I think it's a main topic that must be addressed. Uh, also essential uh, in our views to incentivize the strength and local innovation ecosystems in order to allow for the development of a growing number of applications by domestic companies. Uh, countries should strive to have dynamic AI ecosystems, even if they're not able to have their own, let's say, open AI style companies, but we know that would be unrealistic to, to, to expect. 
uh, so we believe that this uh, effort to incentivizing local ecosystems would be a possible way forward uh, with a view to democratizing this market that, as I said, is very concentrated today. Another topic I wanted to raise is uh, when it comes to risks and mitigation of risks, we think it's important to widen a little bit the scope of what we understand by risks. Uh, we should not lose sight of the big risks, the big risks that AI uh, have has uh, of exponentially amplifying economic, social, and digital divides between developed and developing countries. This should be counted as a risk. Uh, so we have seen from some time now that there's a concept of safety by design that is well accepted by many actors in this field. They are working on it. Uh, we should also work on the notion that new technologies, including AI models, should be inclusive by design in a way that social and digital inclusion should not be an afterthought, but should be at the forefront of our considerations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Mozart. Now, <laughs> I would like to move on to the question three. So uh, we heard that the draft guiding principles and draft code of conduct include principles and actions for AI developers to responsibly share information on security and safety risks posed by the models, the measures taken to address these risks, and to publish transparency reports, and to establish and disclose privacy policies and AI governance policies. What information do you think those organizations should be engaged, encouraged to share? and with who? What elements do you think should be included in transparency reports? How can information sharing be best done along the value chain, especially with downstream developers who further develop and fine tune models? So I would like to invite Chair Vint Cerf to give your answer to this. Uh, so you have three minutes, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to say I'm very, very grateful to uh, the Prime Minister for his opening observations about AI and the Internet Governance Forum. I found them uh, most uh, hopeful and very encouraging. Uh, I also would like to point out to you uh, some parallels. First of all, uh, the Internet is simply a very large software artifact so is artificial intelligence and machine learning. As a young programmer, uh, I became fascinated by the idea that you could use software to create your own little universe, and it would do what you told it to do. Then I discovered that it does what you told it to do, but not necessarily what you wanted it to do. And the difference between those two is called a bug. And I discovered how easy it was to create bugs and how hard it was to find them and fix them in the, so in the software. So why is that relevant? I think all the things that you are hearing about uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning apply generally to software. And so we should be thinking about not just the rules for AI and ML development, but also generally software, we have become intensely dependent on software. Uh, it is by far the most powerful and adaptable technology ever created, and I would argue that the machine learning world has taken a step beyond that. But we have be th with dependency comes risk, and you've heard that theme repeatedly. Uh, the uh, result is that the risks are a function of the application to which the machine learning and AI models are put. And this leads to the question about single points of failure and the side effects of becoming increasingly dependent on these pieces of software. That leads to a very important point about responsibility and the responsible development and use of software. It leads to questions of ethics uh, in research and academia. What kind of research do you perform and under what conditions? How does business apply and use these artificial intelligence and machine learning tools and software in general? And finally, how, does, how are these systems governed? And we've been hearing some major and important initiatives. Now, to come to your specific question uh, about information sharing, 
there are several obvious things that we would want to share. The first one is the source of the training material. Where did this content come from? When these uh, machine learning systems are actually used, it's important to have some uh, idea of how the source material was actually applied and so we can have some sense of uh, judgment about the quality of the uh, resulting system. Uh, we also need to be able to understand uh, under what conditions these systems will misbehave. It's become more and more difficult to predict because the systems are so complex and their uh, function is less like the if-then-else kinds of software that I grew up with and more like a highly probabilistic system that has a probability of being correct and a probability of being not correct. So if we're going to uh, share information, we should be able to share our experiences. We should be able to alert the consumers and users of these applications as to the potential hazards that they might encounter. Uh, I would like to applaud the European Union's effort to grade the risk factors of applications. So there are some high-risk applications like healthcare, health advice, uh, medical diagnosis, which should get considerably more scrutiny, the software that's used to provide those services, whereas if it's just entertainment, perhaps the risk factor is lower. I suspect I've run way over my time, as I can see our, uh, our moderator wielding her um, microphone. So I'll stop there and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vinsoff. I wish I had more time. However, um, now uh, uh, I would like to invite Ms. Wan to respond to the same question. Thank you very much, and thank you to the Japanese government, our host country. Um, Singapore has always uh, cared a lot about AI governance. We had an AI model governance framework in 2018, uh, which we updated in 2022, and are now working on the next update. Uh, in June of this year, we launched the AI Verify Open Source Foundation to have a conversation and a global platform for discussion on AI governance issues. And we also wrote a discussion paper highlighting some of the risks and issues, um, as well as practical solutions to deal uh, with generative AI, its risks and potential pathways forward. Specifically on this question, we do think that there is space for policymakers and industries uh, to co-create a shared responsibility framework as a first step in order to clarify the responsibilities of all parties in the model development life cycle, as well as the safeguards and measures that they need to respectively undertake. Now, there is um, some useful information that can be shared uh, especially by model developers, for example, information about how their models are developed and tested, as well as transparency on the type of training data sets used. Um, specifically to the end user, um, information can be provided, for example, limitations on the performance of models, as well as information on how and whether data input by the user into the model will be used by developers to further enhance the model. We do think such a shared responsibility framework, which is common in the world of software development, will allow us to parse out the different responsibilities uh, and admittedly having a layer of complexity because of the foundational nature of these models. But we do think that for clarity, establishing standardized information to be shared about the model will allow deployers and end users to make proper risk assessments. We do agree that labeling and watermarking of AI-generated content will allow consumers of content uh, to make more informed decisions and choices. And there is certainly great, um, much to commend uh, the globally and internationally aligned efforts with many stakeholders involved in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wan. And I would like to move on to the next question. So the guiding principles and code of conduct include principles and actions for AI developers to invest it and develop security measures, as well as technical measures for content authentication, such as watermarking and content provenance mechanism and data input control measures. What types of measures do you think would be most effective for organizations to invest in or develop? 
So now I would like to invite P President Walker again to respond to this question. So President Walker, you have three minutes. Thank you. The large language models that we're seeing today come out of a problem in search. Originally in search, you're trying to take a word and search the internet for matching words, and then you realize you need to search for synonyms, and then for related concepts. How does the King of England relate to the Queen of Spain? Research that was being done about a dozen years ago mapped every word in English and then ultimately in many languages around the world in mathematical terms, in vectors. And then about five or six years ago, further research that was published helped identify something called transformers, an architecture which allowed us to understand all the richness in human language and soon to be a thousand languages around the world. Now, we've learned many things in working with content on the internet that will carry over to these new challenges of security and content authenticity. So for example, when it comes to security, we believe that we need to work collectively. We have proposed something called a safe AI framework, SAFE for short, that establishes an ecosystem approach to making sure that model weights and other core information are kept secure when necessary, but to Nick's point, made open and available when possible. When it comes to authentication of these tools, there are a number of efforts we are, are progressing. We have an effort called SynthID that identifies video and uh, images that are available at the pixel level. So even if they're transformed or turned upside down or changed in different colors, you can still authenticate where they came from. A second effort has to do with about this image in search, allowing you to understand the provenance of when an image was first uploaded to the internet. And finally, we have adopted a new policy that requires the disclosure of the use of generative AI for election ads in ways that are misleading or that could change the results of elections. These efforts and many more like them across the industry will be an important part of answering this question of how do we make sure we can trust the products of AI. But at the same time, I must say that something can be authenticated and still false. And so we collectively and all of the people around the world, we need to educate ourselves. We need to become digitally literate, AI literate about these new tools so that we understand the underlying meaning and what we can and what we can't trust. Very much. Uh, so now I would like to ask Professor Murai to respond to the same question. Okay. Um, yeah, I remember the, when I visited the, uh, one of the U.S. university and uh, who did uh, uh, the philosophical researches using a computer. That was like uh, uh, early seventies, and uh, so uh, typing in to the other books, philosophy books, and analyzing it, and uh, then, you know, then the understanding what's a human being is, uh, you know, thinking about type of a thing. So um, that was uh, very much, uh, you know, kind of starting up of uh, AI with, with the language uh, information based on that. But the, that, that language was a very much trustable books in the philosophy books and other things. Uh, what's different today for the, you know, working on a generative AI and other things. So, so it's uh, generated from the other people's social networking context and uh, uh, IoT sensor data as well. And uh, uh, many of the uh, information uh, on the web and uh, are generated from everywhere. And uh, then uh, that is uh, basically the uh, very much uh, uh, security measures of the AI today. And uh, then, uh, you know, so sources and the accuracy of the data and uh, how uh, trustable all those uh, information would be. So in Japan, uh, we started uh, uh, one of the industrial efforts called the uh, uh, originator profile, which is uh, uh, the information on the web uh, to be who's originated and then uh, authorized uh, because uh, of that reason, particular reason. Uh, the, in order to achieve that, then you know, the ID and the sources of information and the you know, traceable 
uh, from the exact data is also important. And then not only the text messages for the AI now uh, is a uh, accurate, accurate, accurate number uh, generated from sensors around, uh, which is uh, very much, uh, you know, kind of learning uh, sources for the, uh, you know, global warming and other environmental studies. And uh, so uh, that kind of uh, um, accuracy is going to be uh, uh, monitored and uh, uh, discussed and also uh, with uh, uh, shared uh, as a wisdom among the AI players. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Murai. So I would like to move on to the next question. So the draft guardian principles and draft code of conduct includes requirement for AI developers to promote development of advanced AI systems to address world's greatest challenges such as climate crisis, global health, and education. What fields do you think those organizations should prioritize in their activities and investment other than those described in their previous questions? What are some proactive measures, including giving kinds of incentives to companies we could embed in a code of conduct that would enable innovation as opposed to only mitigating risks? So I would like to invite Ms. Doreen Vodgan martin to respond to this question. So the floor is yours. Thank you. And good morning. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Let me start by thanking the government of, of Japan for putting this topic so high on the agenda here at, um, at the IGF. Um, I think to answer your question, the private sector really is the driving force behind AI innovation. And I would say I'm happy to see how much they're, they're stepping up to address some of the world's greatest problems. And I guess, Nick, I think you mentioned this minimizing the bad and, of course, trying to uh, amplify the good. I guess, Vin, that would be get rid of the bugs <laughs> uh, so that we can amplify that, that good. Um, the private sector is also a, a key constituent in the ITU membership, and happy that two of the ITU members, Meta and Google, uh, are part of the ITU family, because I think that kind of engagement also helps us understand what they're looking for when it comes to providing insights, when it comes to um, our engagements with policymakers and, and, and regulators. Uh, we have found that sort of a combination of incentives are important, uh, ranging from perhaps economic incentives to um, explicit recognition of contributions at national and international levels uh, to help really effectively motivate the private sector uh, to invest in initiatives that ultimately benefit society. Um, of course, that includes innovative public-private partnerships. I think that's, that's key. Uh, you mentioned healthcare, education, climate, definitely. Um, I think I would give perhaps an example, something that, uh, that stands out for me. Uh, we've been very focused on school connectivity. Of course, that's linked also to the WISIS process that had a target to connect every school by 2015. We didn't get there. But we do have an initiative together with UNICEF and many private sector partners, and we're using AI to actually find schools, so we're using AI techniques for mapping. We're also using AI techniques to look at different connectivity configurations so that we can ultimately bring down, bring down cost. And perhaps just to share another example, I would say, um, disaster management, that's a key priority also for the government of, uh, of Japan. I think AI has shown lots of potential in that space. We're part of the Early Warning for All initiative, working closely with, uh, with Japan, uh, WMO, and, and UNEP. We're looking at ways that you can use AI when it comes to data collection and handling, when it comes to natural um, hazard uh, modeling, and of course, when it comes to effective emergency communications. So I think really there, there's probably nothing that we cannot do if we actually manage to leverage uh, multi-stakeholder partnerships to drive positive change. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bogdan Martin. 
So I would like to uh, ask the same question to Mr. Nazal. Yes. Um, yeah, we we concern about uh, misinformation and disinformation actually. So because uh, uh, next year we will have uh, elections, and we try to uh, issue some uh, regulations on the spread of information through the digital platform that using AI and we collaborate with multi-stakeholders also, and we work closely with the uh, global digital platform like uh, Google and Meta as well. And um, hopefully we can handle it because this is really a big test, uh, how AI uh, will use uh, in the next election for the uh, political campaigns, and hopefully we have a fair and safe elections next year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so what about Professor Murai? Yeah, uh, Doreen, thank you very much for raising the, um, the disaster things and the natural disaster earthquake. I mean, that is a really the very important issue of uh, this country, and uh, we are facing always uh, the you know the big earthquake uh, and uh, then you know the recovery from that, but the, every time we encounter the earthquake, uh, then you know, it's a, a lot of uh, uh, digital data uh, network and uh, also all the support and uh, uh, is uh, saving uh, people's life, which is a very very serious one. And the now AI uh, and the, uh, the more precise and the trustable data. Uh, would be a benefit for the you know, kind of a next one so that uh, Japan need to be preparing uh, for that. And another uh, big issue of uh, Japan is a, a very serious elderly society issue, uh, which is uh, when the people get older, uh, then you know, there is a lot of uh, healthcare uh, issues. And uh, then, you know, so healthcare issues, including the hospital and uh, uh, medical data manipulations, uh, which has never been processed in a proper way for the past, I should say, 30 years, uh, right? And uh, not only Japan, though. <laughs> Everywhere in the world, oh, by the way. Uh, anyway, so, so then you know, we started to work on those areas, and then it's a very interesting that the very critical area, like uh, you know, data privacy and uh, you know, the data accuracy, and the manipulation and the uh, amount of the data uh, to manipulate and uh, you know, the amount of the resources of the hardware to do that. Uh, it's gonna be a very serious one. And uh, therefore, the, uh, I, think, I think it's a very important area, healthcare and uh, you know, the, those uh, disaster management area because it's a, a very much a multiple uh, responsibility exists in the, you know, everywhere and uh, then they need to work together. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, the self-assessment is going to be important. Third-party checking is going to be important. And also government involvement, of course, is going to be very important. Therefore, the exactly the very, very uh, important example of a uh, uh, multi, multi-stakeholder model achieving uh, and approaching uh, the AI and the other future. Professor Murai. So I would like to move on to the next question. So how do you foresee AI developing over the next few years? And what do you think organizations developing advanced AI systems do in order to realize trustworthy AI across society? So first, I would like to ask this question to President Clegg. Well, I, <laughs> I think the trick of the problem about the future is it's always very difficult to predict, particularly um, with, with technology which is evolving as fast as it is. Um, um, but I think some things are relatively predictable as far as the development of these large language models are concerned. So one thing I think you'll see fairly soon is a lot of these large language models, as the name implies, were large language models. So they were focused on language and then you had separate models 
based on visual content. And I think those things will merge so that you'll have models which are what they call multimodal. They operate both in terms of text and, and uh, visual content. And that will uh, introduce uh, significant additional versatility to those models. Um, uh, I think the issue of how the, the languages that are used in the training data is a very important one. A lot of these large language models, particularly the ones obviously emanating from the big US tech companies were originally trained in, 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 in English. Um, I think, I mean, that doesn't mean, by the way, that developers can't use the, the, the models and redeploy them in their own language. So for instance, here in Japan, Eliza, a company has t taken Llama 2, it's, it's open sourced form and has um, actually developed a very high performing um, a large language model in, in Japanese here in Japan. But I think you will see those models in future being trained, if I can put it um, at a very sort of foundational level, in multiple languages at the same time. I think one of the big open questions, I'd be very fascinated what um, particularly some of the leading, um, the, uh, it's very difficult to talk about these things, by the way, when you have two godfathers of the internet on the stage. I mean, uh, I defer to them completely, so I just don't know what they think. But I think there has been this assumption that these, that these models just get bigger. I'm not actually necessarily clear if that's necessarily going to turn out like that. I mean, firstly, there's going to be just a just an incentive to be efficient, to be more efficient with data, use less data, use less computing power, you know, use less money. So I think there's going to be a draw. And also, and also, you know, the applications of these models, particularly in their fine-tuned form, will be most uh, impactful, uh, not necessarily because they're bigger, just if they're, if they're just fine-tuned to, to, to deliver particular uh, objectives. So, I think this assumption, which has certainly been there in the public debate, that they just get exponentially bigger all the time, I'm not necessarily sure if that's going to be the case. Um, in any way, these large language models, I mean, there's only so many times that you can re-consume and re-digest all the content, the public content on the internet. You can only do that a few times after, you know, after a while you run out. So, so I think size is going to be, I, I don't think size is the only determinant of capability here, and nor do I think risk is only associated with size either. Thank you very much. Uh, so I would like to ask the uh, same question to uh, the father of internet, Dr. Sir. I'm sure that uh, everyone will recognize that uh, just because I've had a lot to do with the internet doesn't necessarily mean I know anything about artificial intelligence, so you should be careful about my answers. I will tell you something I've learned from a colleague at UCLA, his name is Judah Pearl. He is one of the winners of the Turing Award, which is the top award in computer science for his work in machine learning and AI. He's written two books, one is called Causality and the other one uh, is, um, if I remember that right, causality, and the other one was called the book of why, as in W-H-Y. What was his point? His point was that large um, machine learning models are all about probability. They talk about probabilistic uh, performance. They don't necessarily deal with causality, and so you can't conclude anything from them um, unless you have a causal model to go along with the correlation that these large machine learning models uh, incorporate. And I'm using uh, machine learning here rather than large language model or artificial intelligence very deliberately. Uh, if you don't appreciate causality uh, versus correlation, you'll appreciate the story that some um, parties would conclude looking at the statistics that flat tires cause babies. And the reason for this is that um, there's a high correlation between the number of flat tires occurring near a hospital and the number of babies that are born. And you can quickly appreciate that the real reason that there are flat tires is because someone is racing to get the mother to the hospital so the baby can be born there and not in the car and the result of the fast driving sometimes is flat tires. To give you one other example where causality was really important, at Google, you can imagine we consume a lot of power cooling the data center off. 
because running all those computers generates a lot of heat. Once a week, we used to have an engineer who tried to adjust the valves in order to uh, figure out how to minimize the amount of power required to cool the data center. We trained a machine learning system to perform that task. It saved 40% of the power requirement that we have been able to achieve manually. So causality is going to be our friend here, and we need to incorporate that into the way in which we train and use these models. Joseph, so I would like to ask, to move on to the next question. So do you think there should be consideration given to developing tools or mechanisms to help organization monitor the implementation of the guiding principles and the code of conduct? and to hold organizations accountable for their progress in doing so. So I would like to invite Professor Murai to answer this question. Oh, sorry, I, I missed the, the order. Uh, the, the, it's the, the question number seven. So how, how do we uh, consider about the, the monitoring the implementation of the guiding principles and the code of conduct? Oh, okay, yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, that's a kind of a repeat, but the um, monitoring and the, is a uh, self self assessment is a really important one, and uh, um, the uh, by the any uh, entity who's uh, processing uh, the thing in the code, and uh, it's a uh, uh, my own uh, responsibility to do this, and uh, including the including the individuals. Uh, of the, who's uh, being involved in this uh, is going to be a uh, very important, and uh, um, also the not uh, you know the the apart from yourself and the third party or the uh, independent en entity is going to be uh, you know kind of a monitoring and uh, then uh, uh, sharing the wisdom uh, for the uh, processing is going to be a uh, really important uh, public. Uh, need to uh, address on uh, you know what they should do, but uh, also the uh, investing on the researches and the educations uh, is going to be a very much a government role and the public uh, sector's role, uh, and uh, increasing the uh, quality of the monitoring of the for the AI processes. Thank you, Professor Murai. So I also would like to invite uh, Dr. Sefa again to respond to the same question. Well, of course, the key question here is what do we measure and what objective function are we trying to uh, achieve? And, uh, it takes a great deal of creativity to figure out how to assess the uh, quality of large language models and machine learning models. The concrete objective functions, like the one I mentioned earlier, which is to reduce the cost of cooling off our data centers, are pretty obvious uh, kind of measurement. But it's a much more complex question to answer. Uh, how well did the large language model respond to your prompt and produce its output? Was it usable or not? I don't have a, a deep notion right now of how to apply an objective function to those kinds of applications. The one thing I will say is that uh, if we can um, detect the quality of responses coming back in high-risk environments, that that might be a top priority for us to uh, make sure that if there are high-risk uh, applications being used, that we measure safety as the most important uh, metric of success. Thank you, Dr. Surf. I would like to ask this next question to uh, Mr. Bogdan. So um, as the head of the UN agency working hard to bridge the digital divide, what needs to be done to ensure that the global south is not left behind on AI developments while doing so responsibly? What are some of your recommendations to the Hiroshima AI process in this regard? Thank you. Um, I think, Luciano, you in part kind of answered this before, so I'm gonna pick up um, from, from where you kind of left off. I think you, you can't be part of the AI revolution if you're not part of the digital revolution. Um, so this is a reminder about the 2.6 billion people that are still offline today, the 2.6 billion people that are actually digitally excluded today. Um, so that, that, I would say, 
a clear message maybe, let's not lose sight of some of the fundamentals, the fundamentals around meaningful universal connectivity, um, the building blocks of that universal meaningful connectivity from the infrastructure uh, to the digital skills. I think, Kent, uh, you mentioned that before. The affordability, the cybersecurity, and of course, much, much more. Um, in terms of, of specific recommendations, perhaps I, I would share maybe three. Um, I would say the first is that role of meaningful universal connectivity. I think to um, uh, embrace that in the context of the guiding principles and the code of conduct, um, including perhaps targeted commitments uh, from companies in different areas like capacity development, the skills piece would be great. Um, also focused on the gender gap, we got that big gender gap, so I would uh, just perhaps suggest that. The ITU is very focused on that capacity development piece in the space of AI. We're working to incorporate it in our capacity development offerings together with other UN partners from UNDP, UNESCO, and, and others. I guess my second recommendation would be in the space of the technical standards, and His Excellency the Minister, I think you, you laid that out, I think it was, was point 10, so just um, to ensure that, that, that technical standards are actually a sort of prerequisite when we look at effective implementation of the guidelines. And again, on, on ITU's side, we'll do our part, uh, working with uh, other UN agencies in um, technical standards areas. And I guess the, the last piece, and this is kind of a plea picking up on the SG, the UN SG's comments in the opening, uh, linked to the governance gap, perhaps. Um, and I would say, use the UN as a catalyst for progress in this context, I think that's that's really important. Uh, this morning, the vice minister from Japan uh, kind of plead with us to ensure collaboration amongst these different discussions. So I think that's that's really important. Many things are happening. Many countries are taking different approaches, and I think it's important that we share experiences and work together. Uh, the ITU has the AI for Good Global Summit. We work with some 40 different UN agencies, many of the partners up here on stage. I think that's also a good space to exchange experiences, best practices, and of course the upcoming AI um, advisory body uh, that we heard also mentioned by the SG. I think the, the UN tech envoy was, was in the crowd. But I think that's also another important element because that group will lay out recommendations that we can take forward in the context of the Global Digital Compact and the summit of, of the future. So three pillars, universal connectivity, technical standards, and of course, see um, the UN as a process that can be leveraged. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Baldwin Martin. So I would like to ask the next question to Vice Minister, Mr. Nizal. So how can we engage a wide range of stakeholders on the guiding principles and the code of conduct? Um, yes, uh, this is still a big question uh, for us in Indonesia as well because uh, as you know, that artificial intelligence uh, become a, a hot discussion among countries, and at the global levels, we still seek to the best practices that can uh, inspire us to regulate uh, AI in uh, our country. Uh, but we believe UNESCO also working on it, and we share some uh, insights as well with uh, UNESCO and uh, try to set the uh, fundamental norms uh, on uh, guidelines to uh, implementation of artificial intelligence. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, I would like to uh, ask the same question to Mr. Matza. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I, I mentioned before, I think it's, it's uh, important to make sure the discussion is as inclusive as possible and that allows for a very diverse range of voices and constituents to be heard. So uh, full engagement to other organizations, different stakeholders, I think it's essential to, to ensure uh, the long-term sustainability of this, of this effort. Uh, we believe that 
important in particular uh, to ensure that this process uh, is carried out in dialogue and, and is consistent with efforts that are being developed in other organizations, in other fora, uh, as I said, to ensure this exercise is effective in the long term. So uh, we believe it's important that in due course, uh, those discussions are expanded to multilateral spaces somehow, uh, which can make it more representative and also sustainable. We have a, a concern about fragmentation. Uh, we think fragmentation, there's a parallel institutional fragmentation with fragmentation of the digital world. I think these two things uh, go somehow hand in hand. So we think it's important to look for consistent and cohesion in the discussion, both in terms of the overall narrative about challenges, risks, and opportunities, but also in terms of policies and regulatory approaches. Uh, we believe also that multilateral engagement will also be necessary to reduce a little bit those asymmetries I mentioned before in terms of capabilities and information between developed and developing countries, and so to help countries acquire the expertise and capabilities they need to navigate this landscape with uh, a minimum sense of autonomy and ownership of the process uh, so, so as they can uh, fully enjoy the benefits that I can bring to, to, to everyone. Uh, and I, I think Secretary General uh, Doreen mentioned already discussions in the UN, and I think that's a way forward. We, we encourage countries to double their bet on multilateralism and, and give it a chance. We see that we have important debates in the UN. Uh, in the context of the Global Digital Compact and looking forward in terms of how we engage in the renewal of the mandate of the, of the WISIS. Uh, so I think we have a, a chance to, to place again our energy and effort in the multilateral system and I think that's a great opportunity to give a sense of ownership to everybody in that debate. So that would be my, my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Matsa. So I would like to ask the same question to Ms. Wan. Oh, I think we very much agree with the comments of my colleagues so far. Um, a consultative process is absolutely important, both for developing the principles and the code of conduct, um, as well as technical standards that will eventually um, hold companies, organizations accountable. Uh, it would be useful to hear from other thought leaders um, and countries outside of the G7 um, key groupings. For example, we have the Association of Southeast Asian Nations um, that a number of us are part of. Um, there's also the Forum of Small States that are able to bring together some of the voices in the global south into this conversation. And this will allow the principles and the codes of conduct and the standards to be richer and more textured uh, and able to account for the rich cultural diversity um, that we have um, in the globe. I think the other experience we would share from Singapore's perspective is working very closely with industry players, um, such as those on the stage as well as others and other international and multilateral stakeholder bodies um, on concrete projects to sort of test out this technology, understand um, firsthand, getting your hands dirty on what responsible AI really means um, in context-specific applications, domain-specific applications. Um, drilling down into the detail is very important in this multi-stakeholder process. Uh, we're very supportive of the effort. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wan. So this is the last question. So in addition to our work on the guiding principles and code of conduct for organization developing advanced AI systems, uh, the Hiroshima AI process will seek to elaborate guiding principles for all AI actors and promote project-based cooperation with international organizations. Do you have any views you wish to share on potential outcomes for these future streams of work? What is the most urgent deliverable? I would like to ask this question to President Walker. Thank you. I think today's discussion has illustrated the incredible importance of highlighting both the responsibility side and the opportunity side of this tool. As Vince says, we probably shouldn't call it AI. It's computational statistics. But what an amazing tool it is proving to be. It is giving us ways to help predict the future in different ways. We can now forecast the weather a week away as well as we used to be able to predict it a day away. For issues like earthquakes, today I understand Japan experienced a, a tragic earthquake. Afghanistan, just in the last couple of days, thousands of people were killed in Afghanistan. 
if we could provide just a little bit more warning for issues like that. We are already predicting forest fires and where they might spread. We have tools that will predict flooding that are now covering 80 different countries around the world. So governments working together to understand how they can implement those tools and make them available to their citizens is an important agenda. There are hard trade-offs, of course, between openness and security, transparency, how do we have more explainability for these tools, how to define what tools should be regulated, how model, different models should be classified. But governments are at the forefront of trying to figure out how to get this right. And then there are additional steps that we need to take to understand how to invest in research to make both the research tools and the computation broadly available around the world. And how do we imagine the future of work? In many countries, like Japan, we need desperately to have more productivity for citizens, but that also means that jobs will change. How do we help our, our workers throughout the world imagine a new AI-enabled future where they are more productive and live better, healthier, wealthier lives? So collectively, through efforts like the G7 and the OECD work and the ITU work on AI for good, we're confident that we can actually achieve that potential and we encourage the international community to take an optimistic and forward-looking view in doing just that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to invite President Clegg for the same question. Um, the, 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 the most uh, impactful deliverable. Um, well, I think, um, I think in the broadest sense of the word, transparency, I think one of the things that is happening and why the debate has swithered around so much in recent months is, is um, a sort of mystique and mystery has built up around this technology. Um, it is very powerful. It will be very transformative in many respects. But it, you know, in other respects, what did you call it? What did you call it, Ken? Computational statistics, one way. But I mean, you know, in many ways, they're, they're like, they're like much my cruder version of that. It's like a sort of giant autocomplete system, they're, particularly the large language models, because they're literally just guessing what the next word or rather the next token should be in the response to a human prompt by processing huge amounts of data across you know, vast amounts of um, parameters. But I think sometimes in the debate, we've sort of anthropomorphized the, the, the technology and sort of almost confer in it a certain kind of power, yeah, and intelligence, which it, oddly enough, actually doesn't possess. These systems don't know anything inherently. They, they're just extremely good at guessing some, and predicting and, and along the probabilistic uh, um, logic that was described earlier. So we need to make it as transparent as possible. Transparent in terms of how you know, big companies like Meta and Google develop these models in the first place. How is the data being used? How, how do the model weights operate? What are the red teaming we do to, to make sure it's um, safe? How do we make it accessible to researchers? But also transparent to users. So That's why I stressed earlier, it's in the, in the draft um, Hiroshima Code of Conduct, this work on provenance, detectability, and watermarking. You can't you can't trust something if you can't detect it in the first place. Uh, and, and there's a lot of very, very difficult technical detail involved in that because quite a lot of, uh, in the future, uh, content will be a hybrid between AI and human um, creativity. So how, how, you know, how, do you, how do you identify that? How do you make sure that once you have detected something that has been generated by AI, how does that travel from one platform to the other? The internet is not you know, just balkanized in different silos, uh, uh, content uh, um, uh, flows across the internet around, around the world. So I think transparency, 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 to give people greater comfort that this technology is there to serve them, that they are not there to serve the technology. Thank you, uh, Mr. Clegg. So um, that was our, my, our last question. And uh, as a role of the moderator, I need to summarize this discussion. Uh, ho however, um, I think I need additional one hours to summarize overall this discussion. So I just uh, uh, make some one, one, one or two comments uh, regarding this panel discussion. So once again, I, I really uh, enjoyed this panel discussion. And um, 
since um, so uh, we we have actually discussed about this uh, guiding principles and code of conduct, but uh, what I heard is like beyond the, this kind of guiding principles. So there's a lots of initiatives ongoing, and the, the each companies or the each international organizations uh, and each uh, each uh, nations are actually having their own uh, legal frameworks and their own culture, and they have developing the measures uh, towards this newly developed technology technology, the generative AI, and also the, the, and not only the technology, but also the AI system, the services, including not only machines, but also the interaction with the human beings. And that's really important. And that actually makes it very confusing. And, uh, uh, and, and uh, but uh, that's also, um, it's the very important things. So, um, Today, uh, as uh, Craig lastly mentioned, the transparency is really important. And also the other key words uh, we actually repeatedly heard is the collaboration. And uh, uh, I guess uh, we, we have uh, this IGF forums has uh, uh, lasted more a uh, couple of days. So we can continue to discuss uh, how important uh, this topic is and how we can be responsible, uh, as, responsible as the developers or the, de uh, the deployers or maybe actual users uh, to, uh, uh, to, to kind of face this new technology and to uh, make the society more better. And uh, so uh, today, uh, the discussion, the panel discussion, would be a uh, very effective uh, guide, guidance uh, to the AI Hiroshima process, but also uh, to all of us who are actually interested in this topic. So uh, I, I will stop here, uh, un unless I will kind of, kind of continuously speak out. So lastly, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Suzuki, uh, Minister of Internal Affairs and Communications, uh, for the closing remarks. So uh, thank you very much for your valuable discussions today. As was mentioned by Prime Minister Kishida in his keynote address, Generative AI provides service, services transcending national boundaries and touches the lives of people across the world. It is most beneficial that we were able to engage in discussions at IGF where the stakeholders the world over have gathered. Generative AI entails possibilities as well as risks and is also technology that will transform society in a major way. I'm convinced that today's discussions will deepen our awareness about the risks of generative AI and that it will become a step forward to share the possibilities of generative AI, transcending regions, standpoints, and positions. As for the valuable opinions offered by international organizations, governments, AI developers, and corporations, researchers, and representatives of civil society, we will aim to reflect them in the Hiroshima AI process going forward. Moreover, under Global Partnership on AI, GPAI, we plan to establish an AI expert support center anew to tackle the challenges of AI and broaden the possibilities through project-based initiatives. With regard to these projects-based initiatives to resolve social issues, we have received hopes and expectations from the governments of the Global South yesterday, day zero, in a session hosted by the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications. Today's discussions were most meaningful, and as we continue our discussions on AI governance, it will be important to listen to the views of various concerned persons and we'll make sure to take such initiatives. Thank you very much for your presentations and for your attendance. Thank you very much. This concludes the opening session of Global AI Governance and Generative AI. So please give us, uh, so please give the last round of applause to, for all the panelists. Thank you very much. So the panel is closed, and I'll give back my microphone to the, uh, the master of the conference. Thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the high-level panel of five artificial intelligence. I would like to extend our appreciation for your presence here today. Thank you very much uh, for all the speakers and the panelists. Thank you so much.